Hey everybody, what is up? Welcome back to Funnel Trade. You know, something that I always talk about is having a plan and sticking to it. Whether you're investing in the TCG market or stock market or any other market, you need to take your emotion out of it. You need to have a plan and you need to execute on it without panicking all the time. And one part of that in TCG investing is knowing what you are going to buy ahead of time, knowing what games you like what expansions you think are worthwhile, what products within those expansions, and how much of those products. And so in the past, I've talked about what my basic positions are in each game and each product within those games, etc. And it's something that once in a while I kind of update and talk about on and share my thoughts with, and I thought that's a good time because I've been getting asked again, what is your standard position in everything? And so starting with flesh and blood yes flesh and blood this is simple please james white don't make this more complicated in the future flesh and blood they have one kind of box they do have blitz stacks and they are starting with parting the mist veil they have this collector box but thankfully it's not different types of booster packs it's like the blitz stacks and a play mat some promos and some other stuff i i guess it's more akin to kind of what pokemon does with things like their v union boxes and their um special collector boxes and all those other things but for flesh and blood every set eight booster boxes yeah it's real easy you know and uh flesh and blood makes it easy and man i hope they just keep that up and the thing about flesh and blood is they try to enforce map pricing yeah and uh then a few months after release they allow sellers to go to something like 80 percent of map pricing and um so you can wait a few months on these and you can get them at cheaper prices in fact dust till dawn i think i've still only bought one four box case of i haven't bought the second case of it but very very simple all right let's get into something more complicated magic the mtg and first we're gonna have standard magic okay so standard magic i try to get about two boxes and i say about and i say two and i say boxes because well it's kind of squishy you know in the past i've kind of gone for one collector box and one set box nowadays one collector box one play booster box but you know murders of Karlov manor came out and the collector boxes crashed and so i picked up two collector boxes instead of any play boxes I probably won't go back and pick up any play boxes. You know, I'm just looking for a very, very, very basic position in standard magic sets. When I do my long-term data comparison videos, standard magic does a little bit better than the stock market, but not much, not nearly so good as Pokemon. I like to have a little bit of a position so that in the future I can offer things like box opening videos to patrons, just so when inevitably some of these vastly outperform the rest, I have a little bit of exposure to them. But in general, Standard Magic is kind of the, the worst performing of the regular kind of serious MTG investing type of assets. And so I go kind of light into it. Now, Magic non-standard. And this is going to be master sets. This is going to be things like Universes Beyond. It's going to be things like Baldur's Gate, which is the half premium kind of level. So anything that is non-standard, I go about four boxes. And, you know, same thing here. Uh, for Ravnica Remastered, I've got uh, two collectors and two draft booster boxes. For other sets, I've gone all collectors. I think it was a DM22. I went heavy on the collectors. I did not get any draft boxes of that until much, much later down the road, nearly a year later in the depths of the bear market of 2023, but about four boxes. And that gives me some latitude to say, oh, well, these are cheaper, or maybe I think these are better, or maybe on this one, I don't think the collector boxes are worth the premium. And it gives me a little bit of ability to adjust. Now, when it comes to something like Fallout, where you have the Commander decks, uh, Warhammer 40k is a little different because it was, wasn't it just, yeah, it was just Commander decks. There were no collector boxes of Warhammer, but Fallout is a good example where there's Commander decks and there are collector boxes. I generally do not like putting Commander decks back in the closet because there is no Gambler's Premium. And so I feel like the 
long-term risk is increased by the fact that there is no gambler's premium in the box. So I just don't like those. Hey, if it's your thing, if you think they're going to do great, keep doing your thing. And let me know how it goes. I'd like to see. But for Fallout, I got, I think, three collector boxes so far. And maybe I got a fourth. I got at least three. Um, moving on. Pokemon. Now, Pokemon's where... Pokemon's where it can get a little crazy because, yes, they only have one kind of booster pack, but they have tons of types of boxes of things. And, again, Pokemon has this kind of standard and non-standard arrangement. For standard Pokemon, I get one case of booster boxes. Okay, so that's six booster boxes. And, again, you've seen all my long-term data videos for Pokemon, which I owe you another one of those in about a week. You've seen on those videos that, man, long-term, Pokemon compound annual growth rates are 20, 30, 40% year over year for decades. Wow. So one case of booster boxes, one case of ETBs, elite trainer boxes. Now, elite trainer boxes, when I do the data comparison videos of long-term performance of Pokemon, what you'll see is that the ETBs outperform booster boxes. So if booster boxes are getting 20, 30, 40% compound annual growth rates over a decade, 12, 15 years, ETBs do a bit better than that. Now, volumetrically, if we want to get into some comparison of how big is the storage area, I don't think any of us are dying for storage area that bad, but you know, maybe you are, and maybe in the long term you would expect to. And so you might think, is it worth uh, buying those extra bulky ETBs that don't store value nearly as well? Well, the return is better if you have the room for it. And I get three cases or displays of the build and battle boxes. And these are the boxes, not the stadiums. And these cases, these are the 10 build and battle box display cases. I know it's confusing because they also sell these in a much bigger case that has like, I think 25 of them in it, 25 build and battle boxes. They also have build and battle stadiums, which is a different product that contains build and battle boxes. But these are the packages that are about this big. They have 10 of the little boxes that are about this big. I get three of those cases for every standard Pokemon set. I think those are going to do great in the future. Now, moving on, non-standard Pokemon. Non-stand. Yeah, there we go. Salvage that one. Non-standard, I get a case of ETVs. Now, non-standard, this is like uh, Crown Zenith and 151. For these non-standards, there are no booster boxes. That's how Pokemon gonna get you, is they don't make booster boxes. You have to buy it in all the premium package stuff to get booster packs to rip if you're one of the crazies who rips booster packs for Pokemon. Man, expensive hobby. So I get a case of ETBs, and then I look for three cases. And again, they also don't have build and battle boxes for non-standard sets. So I get three cases or three of the 10 box displays of the booster bundles. Let me try and scribble that out. Booster bundles. Okay. Now the booster bundles have six booster packs. The build and battle boxes have four booster packs. Yeah, it's a little different. But essentially buying three of these, you're getting 30 of the little boxes. And then the case of ETBs. Now, this is the basic position that I attempt to take in everything. And what you see is that when it comes to Pokemon and when it comes to flesh and blood, there's really no deviation because the products are simple. The companies are run by adults and everything works well. With Magic, you got a bunch of idiots running the place and you never know what something's going to cost, what's going to crash, what's going to be so hopelessly oversupplied to the market that you're going to get it at 159 for a collector box and then the next standard set's going to jump up to 300 for a collector box. So, you have to have a little more latitude to move around to figure out what you need to do for magic. All of this said, I still always say you need to be ready to buy a little bit more of the best things when you see deals on them. When you see things like Dominaria remastered collector boxes at $130. Yeah, nobody should have been passing that up. People shouldn't have been selling them that cheap to start with. Um, 
Dominaria remastered draft boxes. What were those on Black Friday? Those got all the way down to like 80 something dollars or were they below 80? Just ridiculous prices. So when you see deals like that, Commander Masters draft boxes for 220, Commander Masters set boxes for 230, you know, be ready to strike a little harder on those things when you see prices so low that there is no remaining downside risk because you can make a lot bigger return with those kind of things than you can if you just allocate all of that to making all of these positions a little bigger. This is kind of like, you know, if you're if you're in the stock market and you have 401k through your employer, this is like your weekly uh, uh, input into that account where some money comes out of your paycheck and you buy some S&P 500 index ETFs. That's kind of like this. It's just a basic position to get you exposure to make sure that you're well-rounded and you're protected against too much risk. Then you might have a little more money that you allocate towards more speculative positions or things that you think are greater value plays, but you don't want to put all of your money initially up front in that. You don't want to concentrate your risk too much because then when you're wrong, you can get hurt a lot worse. Well, let me know what you think, guys, what you're doing on this front, what kind of positions you take and everything. Yes, I still do not take positions in One Piece, in Sorcery, in Lorcana, in Flesh, in MetaZoo, in Weiss, Digimon, ugh, all the other ones. Uh, I do not think any of those are proven out yet for the long term. At some point, maybe Sorcery. I still am hopeful Sorcery can make it through the first couple of years of its existence and that it can become a real full-fledged long-term card game and hopefully it's not just another pump and dump scheme so we shall see let me know what you think guys thanks everybody who makes this content possible especially my very generous patrons who bought me this whiteboard can you believe that man thanks guys i appreciate it like comment share and subscribe and join me on final trade